Good morning, everybody. I am an Italian astronaut of the European Space Agency, Paolo Nespoli. Uh, my background uh, is uh, engineering. In fact, I'm an aerospace engineer. So for me, things started when I was a kid. Um, I, was, um, I was a little kid jumping around and watching TV and seeing the American astronaut on the moon talking uh, to us from the moon. And, and at that time, there were no Italian astronauts. There was no possibility for, for really being an astronaut. But, but I was looking at those images and I thought, wow, I want to go to the moon. I want to drive the lunar jeep, the lunar rover, and see what it feels to go around in the moon. When I was 18, I was drafted by the army and uh, ended up uh, doing uh, paratroop. I was a paratrooper. I was in the special forces. I was uh, going around doing uh, interesting uh, things uh, until at 26, uh, somebody asked me, so Paolo, what do you really want to do in your life? And, uh, and I said, well, you know, once upon a time I wanted to be an astronaut, but uh, I'm too old now, I don't speak English. And you know, life is like a forest. Uh, you, you are on this side of the forest and you need to go on the other side, but you still need to travel through it. And, and that takes quite some courage takes quite some uh, dedication. Some people never start the travel. And I felt that at that time, I still did not do my, my trip and decided to stop what I was doing and concentrate on uh, my dream to become an astronaut. And I had to, I had quite a long forest to cross because uh, uh, the requirements for, for uh, for an astronaut are an engineering degree or, or, or a science degree, uh, speak English at a good level and uh, uh, have a decent uh, medical uh, status, uh, regular health. And I did not have a degree, I did not speak English and I was okay from a medical point of view. So I had to start uh, working pretty hard. Uh, in fact, I enrolled uh, in an American university, so I could get an engineering degree and learn English at the same time. It took quite some time, but, uh, but I managed. And, uh, and so I was uh, happily graduated, uh, ready to go, ready to become an astronaut. And in fact, there was the first call for applications in Italy at that time, it was 1989. I applied, I was selected, called to the end, uh, several selections, several uh, um, committees, but at the end, I did not. I was not selected, and, uh, and, 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 and look, that was it. But, uh, but I kept um, going towards my goal. I did not uh, let go this dream. Uh, a few years later, four years later, there was another selection I applied. I was called again, and I went through the old selection. And of course, I was not selected again. And then another six years later, finally, the third selection, I applied, I was called and I was expecting not to be selected again, but with my surprise, I was one of the two uh, astronauts selected. And in fact, uh, I was called uh, and uh, sent to NASA so I could uh, uh, get uh, qualified on flying on the space shuttle and uh, be one of the crew that would build the space station. Uh, at that time, it did not exist. It was uh, in little pieces. Um, and uh, we were trained for a couple of years on, on what it means to fly on the space shuttle and uh, go up in space and build the space station. It still, it still took another seven years before I managed eventually, finally, to fly in space. It was a, was a really interesting uh, um, event, of course. Uh, we don't go to the moon anymore. We go today, we go to the space station, which is an outpost uh, not that far away from Earth. It's only 400 kilometers, uh, but in order to stay up there, it has to fly at an orbital velocity of 28,000 kilometers per hour. That's more or less eight kilometers per second. Imagine driving on a car at eight kilometers per second. That's, uh, that's a good uh, going. The, the fact is that you're not going straight on a road, you're going around the Earth, and you're actually falling towards the Earth. And this is what makes the whole place really, really interesting and weird, because when you're falling, you are in a situation of microgravity, it means there is no more gravity. And a lot of things happen because of this situation. Uh, it, uh, it feels like uh, you are coming down a flight of stairs and you are thinking about 
something else and you miss a step and oh and there is this moment in which you are kind of falling that's what what it feels in space the only thing is that is that it lasts six months so six months oh whoa. of course after a few few moments you try to get used to it and and learn and behave differently but this is what what it is in space um you are in a confined uh, environment isolated environment with uh, five other astronaut with you. It's not that in the evening you can go out and visit your parents or go and have a pizza and uh, and they work and, and the control center sends up your everyday work and they work you really hard because being in space it's a privilege but it's also hard work. Uh, we do carry out science, uh, technology, education and things like this. Uh, the last thing I would, would like to say about space station is that uh, since it travels at 28,000 kilometers per hour, it takes about uh, an hour and a half to go around the, the world. Uh, that means that every 40, 50 minutes there is a sunrise or a sunset. 16 sunrises, 16 sunsets per day, which makes for a very confusing and interesting uh, place. We will see later. So. This was uh, 2007, I was told you will uh, uh, go in space and contribute to building the space station. The crew that I was uh, assigned was uh, the crew of STS-120, uh, 120, Space Shuttle Discovery, commanded uh, by, by Pamela Merroy, uh, one of the two shuttle commanders. It was really, really interesting. Uh, seven astronauts, uh, six Americans and one Italian. Uh, the idea was to go up in space, bring one of the modules of the space station and move uh, one of the solar array arrays. Of course, we need to remember that contrary to what everybody thinks, astronauts are not geniuses uh, nor a superstar, superhero, superman. They're just regular people. And in fact, we do a lot of mistakes. We get tired if we don't sleep, if we don't eat properly, if we don't exercise, especially in space, you start getting uh, really confused. Uh, and we do have to have uh, uh, emission control. In fact, we have 200, uh, more or less 200 um, specialist flight controllers that sit in their desk and really watch us, watch the vehicle, make sure that everything is working uh, effectively and efficiently. In fact, going in space is more a teamwork. It's more like a soccer game. It's not just one person playing in the field. It's 11 people working together to bring the ball into the goal. And this is what it is. Uh, going in space. So uh, flying on the space shuttle and leaving Earth is pretty is a pretty strong uh, moment. Uh, the, the energy that is inside uh, the space shuttle is the equivalent energy of a mini atomic bomb that explodes in a control manner and throws you in space. So it's pretty hard going there. It doesn't take long. People think it takes hours to go to space. But in fact, from the moment in which we we take off or lift off to the moment in which we reach space and you are in microgravity, it's only eight minutes and 20 seconds on the space shuttle. So you are squeezed on your seat, pinned down because uh, the, the, the rocket is really pushing hard. We can watch together a, a summary of this uh, launch and you will see what even what we feel inside the vehicle when we take off.
So eight and a half minutes and you are in space. Uh, it, uh, there's no time to really look around. There is no time to enjoy it because uh, this 15 days mission, uh, it's very packed of activity minute by minute. So we, we took a, a picture and then we started working. Well, actually not really. We started sleeping because we go up there and it takes quite some time to transform the vehicle uh, from a rocket into a spacecraft. Then you're tired, go to bed because next day you're gonna go and do a lot of things. Like for example, uh, do a rendezvous with the space station. You have to approach and, uh, and uh, attach the vehicle, the shuttle on the space station. This is the shuttle as uh, we approached uh, the station. And as soon as we docked, the hatch opened and sure enough, the commander of the station greeted us and it was Peggy Whitson. So two women commanding two uh, spacecraft uh, in space, a pretty unique uh, event that happened at that time. Uh, we started working immediately, spacewalks, uh, robotics, uh, uh, a lot of activities. We sent out people, it was very complex. Uh, we managed to attach the module that we were supposed to attach. And uh, we even had an emergency in the middle of the mission. We had to work really hard to fix one of the solar arrays that uh, started breaking. Uh, it was a pretty intense uh, moment, almost like Apollo 13, for the people that know what happened on Apollo 13. And 15 days later, we actually were ready to come home. We had accomplished all uh, we needed to accomplish and uh, departed from the station, uh, made sure that everything worked. And in fact, uh, uh, we achieved our goals of connecting one of the modules to the station and deploy one of the solar array. And uh, we landed uh, at Cape Kennedy. It was a really good success. Uh, I was told, Paolo, very good, you worked really well, and uh, we're gonna assign you to another space flight very quickly. But life is not always so simple, and uh, the road is not always a straight freeway, and it can go pretty, pretty in a turning way. And this is what happened with me. There were some problems. They could not assign me to another shuttle flight. Uh, but eventually, a year and a half later, I was told, uh, well, when you're not going to fly on the shuttle, you're going to fly on the Russian vehicle called Soyuz. And with that, you will go to the space station. It will not stay only 15 days, you will stay almost six months. And unfortunately, being the vehicle uh, Russian, you need to move yourself from Houston to Moscow. Uh, you need to learn Russian. You need to qualify in a new vehicle. It's going to take three years uh, to do all of this. You need to train on the experiments that you will carry out for six months in space, and then you will fly again. So I was assigned to a new crew. Dmitry Kondratyev in the middle is, was the new commander. And then uh, Katie Coleman, uh, an American astronaut. Uh, uh, we three worked together to uh, fly on this very small uh, Russian rocket to go on the station. And uh, once we arrive on the station, we found uh, three more astronauts up there. And it's nice that when you fly, you go up and there are three people that are there since three months. So they know what's going on and they can react in case of emergency. They can do things while you adapt. Because it takes, uh, takes quite some time bef before you really start working effectively and efficiently on the station. Because now it's not anymore a 15-day shuttle mission where it's push, 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 push. This is more like a marathon or a double marathon. You really need to become an extraterrestrial person. What does that mean? It means that you know, there is no more up, no more down. So you need to really to readjust your, uh, your way of moving. For example, you cannot walk in space. You move around on the space station using your hands, pushing. And then you have to be careful because if you push too fast, you are going too fast, you're not going to bump into something. Uh, or uh, you're going to miss uh, where you're going to go. So uh, you really need to readjust. And, and it's interesting because um, this is a little bit what happens in life. Life is a continuous readjustment according to what happens around you the economical situation, the school change, the family change. And if you are too rigid and you do not change, you do not explore the other environment, you fail to understand what's around you and what you can do with these new things. And space is the same. If you're rigid, you're sitting there and you wanted gravity again and you're, you, 
you, you still behave like a terrestrial person, it will never work. You need to understand you're in a new environment and instead of missing things that will not come, you should explore, understand what they are more, take advantage of this and be able to do things that are uh, impossible when you are uh, on the ground. Um, we did carry out a lot of experiments. Our time on the station, it's mostly dedicated to carry out science, uh, technological experiments from 7.30 in the morning until 8.30 in the evening. That's the working day planned uh, by the mission control. Inside this time, there is one hour for lunch or lunch break and two hours of physical fitness. We need to do exercise in space because without gravity, the bones, uh, uh, suffer, the muscles suffer, the brain gets kind of crazy, so you need to do exercise. Um, so we did uh, in total, uh, all of six of us in six months, about 140 different experiments. Uh, some very complicated, some uh, really um, simple, uh, but all very interesting. Uh, just to show you again uh, some of the things that happen to the body when it's exposed for a long time to a microgravity situation. I wanted to show you this picture of Katie Coleman in a Japanese laboratory. By the way, on the station there is an American laboratory, Japanese laboratory, European laboratory, uh, and a Russian laboratory. They, with, these are the partners of the space station. Uh, so if you look uh, carefully at this picture, you probably will notice that uh, the hair do not stay there. They float away as everything that you let go floats away. See, here on Earth, if we lose something, we just look on the floor and it's probably there somewhere. In space, you lose something, it's lost, it's gone, anywhere. It could be any, any possible way and most likely you will not find it so easy. So you need to learn to control things in a different way. If you look carefully at Katie, you probably would see that her face is slightly reddish. And this is due to a shifting on the fluids. There's no more gravity that pulls the fluids uh, down to the legs. The, the fluids will come up, but you feel like this. So you will, in the first hours you go in space, go to the bathroom. Uh, the body is expelling some liquids, trying to lower the pressure, but it's not completely successful. So we stay in space for six months and it feels like you are upside down with your head down and your legs up. And, and actually the brain gets squeezed, the optical nerve gets squeezed, the eye loses the spherical shape, the retina moves and then you cannot see anymore. You cannot see well anymore. You probably need glasses to be able to read. Uh, we, we, we actually turned out that some of the astronauts suffer in these conditions. There were at least so far five astronauts that had pretty serious damages to the eyes because of this situation. And this is part of uh, some of the investigations that the scientists the, are doing, trying to figure out what happens inside the body. If you look at Katie also carefully, you see that she has cables all over on her wrist, uh, equipment to measure her uh, status. And this is because uh, there is another very important uh, modification that happens in the body. Uh, and this is due to the fact of lack of gravity again but um, the, the brain senses that there is no more gravity and correctly decides that we don't need the skeleton anymore. So stops uh, uh, building in and fixing it, that does here on Earth all the time, and not only that, starts dissolving the skeleton. And we end up losing calcium about 10 times faster than an osteoporotic person here on Earth which makes us perfect guinea pigs, meaning that the scientists are looking at us and say, wow, look at this guy, he's losing 10 times calcium faster than, than a, a sick person on Earth. So we can, uh, we can check what he's doing, uh, give him some medication. Katie took uh, a, a pill, a medication each day for six months to see if this would stop this process. To me, they, they, they made me do some special diets for a week of Die with a lot of salt, uh, with a lot of potassium, and, and so on. And then at the end of the week, uh, a, um, 48 hours of uh, measuring uh, on the body, uh, blood uh, analysis, urine analysis, uh, and all the rest. So essentially, we go in space after all this year, and you are a guinea pig. Or you are a 
you are the hand of a scientist which wants to do experiments, uh, but they are not in space, so they teach you how to carry out these experiments. And it's pretty, pretty much uh, interesting because it can go from experiments that have to do with brain, uh, with the body, but also experiments that have to do with fluids uh, or with metallurgy or with, with all sorts of things in 360 degrees. In fact, I always say that astronauts are not super genius or superheroes, uh, but are normal people that are able to work at 360 degrees in every field. For example, the toilet breaks, it's not you can call Houston, Houston, can you send up a plumber? I mean, guess who's gonna fix the toilet? Or, you know, anything breaks, you, you, you are there, you are the resource. I am an engineer and I was trained like a medical doctor to do emergency uh, work in case somebody had an emergency on board. And, this is interesting because now you, you really learn a lot of other things. Um, so there is one, one more thing that I would like uh, to mention about Space Station. Uh, Space Station has a unique uh, window, it's called the cupola, uh, and this cupola has uh, seven huge uh, windows, and when you are inside the cupola, you can actually look down, and there is the Earth passing under you at eight kilometers per second. Uh, you know, during the day we're really, really, really busy, we cannot do anything. But what I did in the evening, instead of going to bed, we are supposed to sleep from 10 o'clock in the evening until 6 o'clock in the morning, I would not go to bed at 10 o'clock, I would go to bed at midnight or 1 o'clock and take these two or three hours to actually do what I wanted to do in space that I could not because I had no time. And one of the things that I wanted to do is go to the cupola, look at the earth and take some pictures. Pictures, photography was one of my passion that I always had when I was a kid. So I used to go there at the cupola, spend an hour there, and when you go up there and you look down on earth, if it is white because there is snow, you just wait a few minutes and it's gonna be spring, it's no more winter. And then you wait a few minutes and it's gonna be summer. Then you wait a few minutes, you are over Australia, over Africa, over India, over Europe. So in, in an hour and a half, you're actually going to see the whole world, day and night, four season and everything. So I was sitting there on this cupola with my camera, actually taking pictures really, really, really fast because, you know, things pass at eight kilometers per second. If you are not ready to take a picture, it's gone in two or three seconds. So I want to show to you some of these uh, beautiful pictures that, by the way, you can find on internet. Google or ask for a, a ISS, International Space Station, picture from space, and even astronauts that are now in space, uh, they are constantly sending uh, pictures to show you, to show us uh, the view from up there. So. I want to show you some of these pictures. This is uh, Patagonia, actually, with a lot of glaciers, something that is not really common here in Africa. Uh, this is the Caribbean, very blue spot. Uh, this is uh, Amazon, the Amazon basins in uh, South America. Uh, this is Africa, this is Senegal, there, as we see it from space. Beautiful colors, uh, the blue of the oceans and the green of the forest, uh, it's just amazing. Uh, Grand Canyon in the United States, we can see it in this way. Uh, and this is Johannesburg, South Africa, seen uh, at night. You know, the world really lit up uh, during night and you can see where the people are, which is almost everywhere. Uh, by the way, by looking at this picture, uh, we can really even understand that uh, we are using resources in a way that is not really maybe efficient, uh, because all the lights that we see in space, it's light that escapes and uh, it's just wasted light, so we should be a little bit more attentive on how we use uh, our resources. This is a desert in Yemen, if I'm not wrong, uh, and, uh, and uh, this is another desert in um, Egypt, actually talking about Egypt, if you look carefully in the middle of this picture, you actually see the pyramids. It was quite a feat uh, for me to, able, to be able to, 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 to photograph them from 400 kilometers, uh, but I managed. It was one of the challenges that I had. It took me several weeks of trying, but I did manage. Um, this is uh, Australia now, the desert of Australia. There is this uh, 
These lakes and uh, once in a year with special condition they bloom with algae which are very green from, from space you see everything red in this green spot up there. This is uh, Italy actually, my country, this is the Vesuvio which is a dormant volcano. It's uh, obvious from this picture that you know there is a there are a lot of people staying inside there around the volcano. So it's, n it's not that smart, and I usually use these pictures to show to my fellow countrymen that we need to pay attention to this to these things. And so I'm I really hope that in the future, and I'm pretty sure this will happen, everybody could go in space. Like today we can buy a ticket and fly in another continent. This will happen and you will have the opportunity to uh, either be tourists and go in space or even participate to the exploration of the solar system and maybe even go out. You never know what happens in the future. You know, we really want to go back to the moon. We want to go to Mars and uh, you could or can be part of this dream. I, I always tell people and, and I'm telling you today that you need to be attentive because, you know, you have to take your trip through the forest. Don't stay on this side of the forest, go on the other side. Really believe that the future is yours. You are the controller of your future. Then, dream impossible dreams. You know, a dream should be impossible, otherwise it's not a dream. So dream impossible dreams, then wake up, start working on it. You need to study, you need to prepare yourself, you need to focus, you need to try things, you need to dare yourself, you need to be persistent, you need to learn from your mistakes and there will be mistakes, uh, even failures. Failures and mistakes are good if, they are, if these are learning uh, moments and you're not going to do them again. But do all of this and, uh, and believe always that dream can come true and they will. We'll see you in space. Ciao.